Buffalo Trace is the most award-winning distillery in the world, and they've received $1.2 billion from the Sazerac company to build more on their property and increase their product. We are now just starting to bottle bourbons we put in barrels when the bourbon boom started, says our tour guide, Jimmy C. You can see behind us to the left of the Buffalo Trace Water Tower, another building right on top of that bridge. That's one of our new uh, warehouses. Uh, those new warehouses hold almost 60,000 barrels. We built 15 new ones up there, giving us the capability to aid somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 million barrels on this 450 some acres. If you're interested in learning more about the history of Buffalo Trace Distillery and their multiple master distillers who have each made their imprint here, then the old Taylor tour will bear it all. To do so, our tour guide takes us back to the 1700s to learn more about the life of the influential founder, Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor Jr. Hello, I am here with Mr. E.H. Taylor. We are about to begin the Taylor tour here at Buffalo Trace, going through all of their history of the distillery and seeing some special things today, so follow along. Young E.H. Taylor was orphaned and raised by his great uncle, the 12th President of the United States, Zachary Taylor. He's known as the father of modern distillation, but for those who knew him, he's also a man of a hundred suits because he was quite a fashionable fellow. Uh, Colonel Taylor was a, a very well-dressed man. He was extraordinarily well-dressed. They said he had a cane for every hour of the day, and he had a suit for every hour of the day. He used to change, as I said, he's changed clothes several times depending on what the occasion was. And he had uh, 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 vests, and we have, up in the attic at Scotland Farm, we have um, an old cedar closet. And I would think by now the cedar's worn out and the moths would have eaten it up. But there were all of his suits, his, uh, like this suit here he had on. I've got this one. I brought it down to Buffalo Trace for their celebration for buying the, uh, new, the, the whiskey brand just recently. But that suit's hanging in the attic at Scotland Farm. He worked in commodities, trading, and local politics. E.H. Taylor also became a Kentucky State Representative. In fact, he once worked on an amendment to keep Frankfurt as the capital of Kentucky. It was his scrapbook of every clipping of his career, and also the scrapbook included the clippings of him fighting to see that the capital of Kentucky stayed in Frankfurt. As a senator, he knew he was going to be defeated even though he had paid every one of these people in whiskey and every legislator he could to vote for him, he knew he was going to lose. And it's not any different than uh, the Congress today or legislatures in these various cities. They allocate the money that they have and then as they get it, then they divide it up and put it in their pockets, you know. So here he was, knowing he was going to be defeated with this bill. If they had time to really consider it and vote and fight him on it because they wanted to go to Lexington or Louisville because there was big money that wanted the capital. So the evening before, right before they were to close everything, he slipped in an amendment stating that two cents out of every hundred dollars would be devoted to raising money to build a new capital in Frankfurt. And at that time, it was going to cost $75,000 to build the capital. So much to the chagrin of the opponents, they thought, that no good, you know, I don't know what kind of cuss words they used in those days, but there was the bill in there, and they knew that it would delay for weeks or maybe months of fighting over it to get it out of there, and they wanted their money, so they all the majority voted for it. And so all of a sudden, Frankfurt not only had the capital, but they were going to have a new capital. Although Colonel Taylor was influential in the politics of Kentucky, his passion was whiskey. E.H. Taylor started distilling in 1869. Colonel Taylor bought a small distillery in Leestown, which is now Franklin County, in 1869 on the banks of the Kentucky River. He had high standards, so he began to build a distillery based off of his travels in Scotland. 
he was the first to introduce modern technology to distilleries. He used copper fermentation tanks. Colonel Taylor named his distillery OFC, Old Fire Copper Distillery. Water from the Limestone River has made this perfect for whiskey making, said Jimmy. But during the winter and high flood seasons, OFC was not the best location to build a distillery. Backing up to the Kentucky River, there were at times high floods or snow. You can still see the water lines today. This is how fast uh, some uh, settlers or whiskey makers would push off with uh, 15 or 20 barrels of bourbon. They built a big raft, and that's how fast they would go. Making pretty good time. The river's up. Uh, but in uh, August, when there's no current, man, it's like molasses in the winter time. You know, it just flows. So they would have to push their poles. And that was a very perilous journey, but it kind of turned out to be good because it would get very hot on the Kentucky River uh, during the daytime. It would get cool at night, and so you'd have cool spells. And it took them five or six months sometime to get there. So the whiskey aged, aged in that period of time. And it created a different personality on the older bourbon that came from Bourbon County than some of the newer whiskey that didn't age as long. And that's why people fell, fell in love with it. They called it Bourbon County Whiskey, and uh, that's where we got started. E.H. Taylor partnered with George T. Stagg, who helped fund Taylor's distillery. In fact, he partnered with over a dozen distilleries over his years. Colonel Taylor was an entrepreneur of all entrepreneurs. He owned shares of, or all of, at probably a dozen distilleries over his career. Had some wonderful partnerships, and he had some that weren't so good because you have personalities and, and uh, uh, involved in things, but he was so good. For instance, James Pepper, when he died, old man James Pepper died, he had a, uh, a distillery out there around Millville. Uh, young Pepper took it over and lost the money and was going broke. And Colonel Taylor came to him and said, I'll tell you what, I'll be your full partner, and after we get it on its feet, you could buy it back from me. So he took the pepper and got it back on his feet, sold it back to the young pepper. Is this the distillery that later became LeBron and Graham? That's LeBron and Graham and Woodford now. It's called Woodford. And LeBron and Graham, I believe that's right. Le 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 LeBron and Graham, uh, this picture right here was taken at that supposedly at that desk because there is a film out there if you go to see their film it shows him sitting at his desk at LeBron and Graham and uh, but he owned uh, uh, a major share of that and right down the road he uh, uh, started Old Taylor Distillery he owned Old Crow for a while um, he just owned all well he owned this in partnership with um, a couple of people in 1897, the Bottled and Bond Act was enacted by Congress. E.H. Taylor wanted to set apart pure, unaltered whiskey from the turpentine or gasoline-filled bottles out there, tricking whiskey drinkers. He approached Congress and lobbied away for the government to get their whiskey tax and to guarantee that his product would sell. When he was 47 years old, he was out of money again. Had to sell everything. And they asked him, why he had lost all of his money. He said, well, and I'm not going to use his words because I don't remember his words. He said, I put in the most up-to-date equipment because he was known for being the father of bourbon whiskey, fine bourbon whiskey. He said, I put in the finest equipment and he said, the economy went down we had a depression. I couldn't sell my whiskey, and I owed this money. That's it. But when things came back, he had warehouses of whiskey. Warehouses. Couldn't sell them. Because everybody had whiskey. And so in those days, a lot of the whiskey was poison. You know, it was bad. He was the first person to get the good housekeeping seal of approval. We never, nobody else got into whiskey. The good, we have a plaque. The good house, he seal of approval and got the uh, certificate. What epic was that that he 
Let's that see, was that's right. uh, Colonel Taylor, the old Taylor Distillery. And I'm not sure whether it was late 1800s or early 1900s. Probably the early 1900s. The reason why is that then he thought, how am I going to sell this whiskey? Just like, how is he going to introduce it to New York, Chicago, and you know, putting these bottles in the Wall Street trash cans, you know, and the wealthy guys come. So I had asked him, he thought, what am I going to do with all this whiskey? Well, two things were important to him, pure whiskey, and he was trying, oh, and also, these whiskey makers were selling warehouse receipts, which meant that I would come to you and you were a whiskey maker, and I'd say, I want to buy some of your whiskey, and say, okay, uh, pay me and I'll give you receipts, and when you're ready for it, you just come get it. Well, a lot of times these guys would buy the warehouse receipts, come to get the whiskey, and there wasn't any in the, the warehouses. <laughs> you know, they were. So, he went to Washington, and he lobbied them. That's the word they use now. He didn't use that word. They didn't have that word. I don't think. To have bottled and bond whiskey, which meant several things. One, it meant that that bottle was bonded and had certain purity standards and also had to be of a certain proof so that, I think it was 100 proof, I'm not sure, and was locked in a warehouse with a federal seal on it so that they were guaranteed that every time a bottle of whiskey went out of that warehouse, the federal government was paid their whiskey tax. So immediately, he was able to trade a weenie for a ham, as it were. He was able to give the government a way of controlling the taxes on whiskey, and he was able to guarantee that his whiskey was in the warehouse and it was pure. So what happened? As soon as that was passed, his was the first one that was bottled and bond with the warehouses that way. So the whiskey buyers would come in and know that the whiskey was there and know it was pure. So he sold his whiskey. So he was responsible for bottled and bond and the purity food laws and the good husky heels. E.H. Taylor's bourbon is made with Mashville 1, has a sweetness from the corn as well as butterscotch and licorice flavors. This bottled and bond collection consists of their small batch, single barrel, tornado surviving bourbon from Warehouse C, and more. However, according to Taylor, it hasn't always been so popular. This particular bottle was bottled in 1916. 1914. Or, uh, 1914. And I was coming out to Buffalo Trace to meet with, uh, with uh, Mark Brown. And uh, I had met with him once before. And they said, we're trying to find one of the original labels because we are going to make Old Taylor whiskey a top shelf whiskey. Well, he explained to me top shelf means the expensive whiskeys are on the top shelf, on the bottom shelf are the cheap whiskeys. So when you go into a liquor store, if you want to get something expensive, you reach high. And so he said it'll be a top shelf whiskey, but we want to find the label. We can't find a label. Well, I had one bottle, and he said, no, that's not it. There's one older than that. So my wife, Joanna, uh, uh, who uh, knows all and sees all, literally, uh, said, Taylor, I think you've got a bottle up in the, stored in the attic under the eaves. And I said, well, Joanna, my knees don't feel so good this morning. Would you want to go in there and, and look this is where, before we're going to come out here and see Mark again? And so I walked in and put this down on his desk. And I've never seen a man so happy in my life because there was Colonel Taylor's image, that side. But voila, on the other side was a sketch of Buffalo Trace Distillery right here. And this was the label that he was looking for. E.H. Taylor later had to sell off his shares to George T. Stagg and leave behind OFC. He bought land and built a new distillery. However, no one was buying bourbon at the time. It was abandoned, but later bought and redeemed as an operating distillery during the bourbon boom in 2014. The magnificent castle-like structure has E.H. Taylor's fingerprint on it. It's now named Castle and Key. 
And uh, this is one of the vests that he would have worn. It's very pretty because it's got these buttons on it. So I just put it on this morning and uh, uh, thought I would use it for the interview. I've never worn it before. It's the first time. So at least I know that he was about my size. I know that he had broad shoulders and was a powerful man. He wasn't maybe as tall as I am, uh, but he was just a, just a, a powerhouse. He was a, mentally a powerhouse, and he was physically a powerhouse. He had, he was, what's the word, indefatigable. <laughs> he was tireless. The, the man could do several things at once, and, uh, and he was able to, uh, 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 interestingly enough, he uh, uh, one time was uh, out of money. We call it bankrupt today, but he didn't go bankrupt. But he owed all this money, and I don't know whether it was at this distillery or the one down there in Millville, but he knew that his creditors were going to close him down and take over. So he left his son Swagger sitting behind his desk, and he left town. Went to Europe. And so, just like in the movies, here came all these creditors banging on the door, you know, holding their notes and everything that he was owed. And um, they said, where is he? Where is he? And said, he's in Europe. And said, what are you doing here? He says, I'm his son. I'm speaking for him. And uh, he said, uh, they said, well, uh, he said, he's left me with a proposition for you. If you will all sign this, he will pay you this amount of money on a certain time, and he will do this, and he will do that. And so they looked at it. They put it down and said, how do we know he's going to live up to this? Swagger so looked at him and said, because he's my father. During Albert B. Blanton's operation starting in 1921, he decided to use OFC as storage. The cement fermentation tanks lined with copper were filled and sealed with concrete. It was forgotten for 70 years. Later, a team was assembled to dig around the river. They found artifacts, copper, tools, and some of Taylor's copper mash fermentation tanks. They found OFC. Currently, a new mash is brewing in the old OFC building. It's exciting to see a resurgence of an experimental product being prepared in the original OFC structure. I would say he was a perfectionist. He was a uh, visionary. He um, well, the, the, the people that own this distillery, uh, old, old Taylor distillery, before it was bought by. Uh, Buffalo Trace just recently had a big ad in the paper one time that showed Colonel Taylor with an axe chopping up barrels of whiskey because he had tasted the whiskey and he didn't like it and he was with a temper so I think he had a great temper I think he was articulate he, uh, he was also a great entertainer just like my grandmother was I love bourbon. I don't drink a lot of it, or I don't function. Uh, I love, I've never seen a drink that I didn't like, but I don't drink a lot because I saw what happens to all of those, the, 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 the ancestors who drank. Colonel Taylor, by the, uh, uh, by the way, did not drink. Colonel Taylor did not drink at all. Yet when he was sitting in the uh, church where he went to church every Sunday, one time the minister railed against whiskey. He quietly got up with his family, walked out in the middle of the sermon, he walked down the street and sat down at the church down the street and never went back to that other one again. Thank you so much for joining us on our Old Taylor tour here at Buffalo Trace. Also, thank you to the University of Kentucky for lending me the clips of E.H. Taylor Hay Jr. It was wonderful to see his side of the story and have oral history be a part of so much of what we love and know about bourbon. If you enjoy our content and are looking forward to more, please like and subscribe. With that, I'm Camille Starnes. Bye, guys. <laughs>